particular welcome to those who are visiting us uh, for the first time. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, you will join and you will be uh, very welcome to be part of our worship. You're welcome also um, to join us after the service if you want uh, for uh, a cup of tea or coffee and some fellowship. Uh, it's uh, a slightly complicated uh, day today. Please sit down anywhere you want, either side. You're very welcome. Um, it's a lot complicated today because, as you most of you will know, uh, we have a meeting immediately after the service uh, to which uh, uh, church members and friends of the local church are invited in which we will discuss uh, God in Love, Love Unites Us and we will consider whether this church should become a place where equal marriage can be solemnized. Um, if, you, uh, uh, if you're not joining the meeting, you can uh, move into the hall um, and uh, in any case, uh, the meeting will not be very long and afterwards, everybody will be going into the hall anyway. And um, there is a uh, St. James Street Kitchen this week. It's on Wednesday, as usual. It is from 12.30 to two o'clock. It is a buffet lunch, not a, um, uh, not our usual uh, soup and pudding. And, uh, uh, we are celebrating this week uh, the uh, Platinum Jubilee. Uh, so uh, there will be special fare on offer. And uh, we have uh, uh, also invited people who live locally to come and join us. And if they all come and join us, uh, the people who run it will be totally overwhelmed, but that's something else. <laughs> Um, I haven't had any other notices. Has anybody got another notice? Okay. Uh, well, in that case, invite you all to uh, uh, lower your heads, join in silent prayer, and uh, then Reverend Bethany, Bethany will lead us in our worship this morning. Dear Lord, be with us this morning as we worship you and praise you and listen to your word. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to everyone. And Roger's information was correct that we did say we were going to have the meeting immediately following worship, but I think going to make a judgment call this morning and say we'll all go for a cup of coffee or tea and then we'll come back for the meeting. Um, I know there's a few people that want to run someone home or are going to be coming um, just at 1230 and since we have some visitors with us today we can have a cup of tea and then we'll come back for the meeting. So hopefully that's all right. <laughs> ah, let us begin our time of worship together with this call to worship. The words will be on the screen. And I invite you to join me when the words are in yellow. Welcome. We are gathered here to celebrate the great promise. Our hearts are ready to receive this good news. Jesus asked all of his friends to live lives reflecting the love of God. We are numbered among these friends. Open your hearts today. Hear God's special word just for you. Lord, help us to be ready to receive your word and to live your word and to live in your love. Amen. <laughs> Our usual tech guy isn't here this morning, but Jess is doing a great job. <laughs> oh, all right, let us get ready to sing our first hymn this morning. It's number 297, Christ is Alive, Let Christians Sing.
Let us be together in a spirit of prayer. God of incredible surprises, as we gaze into the clouds, remind us that we are standing on holy ground. Place our feet on the pathways of peace and hope. Draw our attention from the vision of the Lord rising to the heavens to be with you and help us to focus on the ministries that you would have us do. Keep us ready and willing always to serve you all our days. Amen. And now I invite Wendy forward to read for us from the book of Acts. Today is what is known as Ascension Sunday, and so both our Acts reading and our Gospel reading will tell the story of Jesus ascending into heaven. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken to heaven and after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, he said, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Thank you, Wendy. I want to invite us all to just take a moment and close our eyes and to picture that last bit of the scripture reading that Wendy just read for us. The disciples have been with Jesus off and on for 40 days since his resurrection. And now he is saying his final goodbye to them. And they watch as he gets lifted up into heaven before their very eyes. So I want you to just hold that image for a moment. To imagine what that might have felt like for the disciples. Think about what that might mean for us. And now let us pray together. Forgiving and gracious God, you have called us to be your church, to live out our resurrection faith. You have asked us to place our trust in you and to bring to all the good news of your saving love. But at times we have failed to do this. 
We have given our faith a backseat to the troubles of this world and to the stresses in our own lives. Sometimes we look for the quick and easy answers. Forgive us for the smallness of our faith. You who raised Christ from the dead have promised to raise our spirits and bring us to new life. You have done this, and yet we remain static in our response to you. Clear our spirits of the clutter of everyday living. Help us to be open always to your word and your love. Challenge us to move in directions of peace and hope for all people. These things we pray in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. And now I invite David forward to read for us from the Gospel of Luke, a similar telling of the same story. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> the reading is from the close of the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 24, verses 44 to 53. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The Ascension of Jesus. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually in the temple, praising God. Here ends the gospel reading. Amen. Now let us sing together our next hymn, number 300 in Singing the Faith. Hail the day that sees him rise.
Amen. You may be seated. Darren and Ezra want to come forward for a minute? <laughs> yeah. Come on, Ezra. Oh, <laughs> it's like, wait, there's people. <laughs> oh, I said Darren and Ezra. I meant Reuben. <laughs> Hi, Reuben. <laughs> you want to sit down with me? Yeah. Hi, Ezra. Are you hungry? <laughs> So today is a big day in the church, and this is a big word that I know you're not going to know. Probably a lot of the adults don't know, but today is Ascension Sunday. And so Ascension is when something kind of floats up into the sky. Can you think of anything that floats up into the sky? Yeah? Like what? Like a stone? Well, well. <laughs> what about like a, a balloon? Have you ever held a balloon? And it floats. Did you ever let go of a balloon and watch it kind of float away? Yeah. Yeah. Or sometimes maybe if you get a, a dandelion and you blow on it and all the, all the bits float away. Yeah. So that's what, what Jesus did on this day. But he didn't disappear forever, did he? No. Where do we find Jesus today? Yeah. In our hearts, right? Yeah. So some people think Ascension Sunday, oh, kind of a sad Sunday. It's the, it's the day that Jesus left and left us all behind. Well, we don't have to worry about that because we know that Jesus lives here. Can you point here to your heart? Point right here. Yeah, close enough in your stomach. You know, he can live in our gut. That's fine too. <laughs> and we're really happy that Jesus is with us all the time, right? Yeah. Okay. So you want to go back and sit with mom and dad? <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Well, happy Ascension Sunday. It's finally here. Did you all have trouble sleeping last night because you were so excited for today? I know I did. Ascension Sunday Eve is one of my favorite nights of the year. Of course, it's nothing compared to the actual day. Did you all get your Ascension Sunday cards exchanged this morning? Your Ascension Sunday chocolates and presents? Don't worry, you can give me my gifts after worship. <laughs> Traditional presents include helium balloons and kites, anything that you can let go of and watch drift off into the sky, just like Jesus did. Well, I'm being silly, of course. Ascension Sunday hasn't been taken over by our secular culture in any way. There is no corporate marketing campaign for Ascension Sunday, no special foods we need to go out and buy, no cards to give, no gifts to painstakingly wrap, no cheery mascots bringing presents down a chimney or leaving us chocolate eggs. Ascension Sunday is ignored by the secular world. And if we, are often, if we are honest, it is often ignored in the church as well. When it comes to our high holy days, it just doesn't seem to rank up there with Christmas or Easter or even Pentecost, which we will celebrate next week. And I've always wondered why that is. Why do we treat Ascension Sunday like the black sheep of Christian holidays? John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, actually considered Ascension Sunday to be rather important. When he was creating the liturgical calendar, that church year for the American Methodist Church, Ascension Sunday was one of the few holy days that he kept. Remember, John Wesley was a Church of England vicar until the day he died. So he celebrated all those feast days with all the saints and all of the special days. But when he was creating the Methodist Church in the U.S., he cut out all of the various saints. He even cut out Maundy Thursday, which is that day during Holy Week when we celebrate the gift of communion. Yet in his ruthless trimming of the Christian calendar, he chose to keep the celebration of the Ascension. And the Ascension is widely recognized by most Christian denominations by most other Protestant denominations and the Catholic Church. It's an ecumenically recognized event 
And we even all agree on when it occurs, exactly 40 days after Easter. Although if it falls on a weekday, which it usually does, Thursday uh, this year, then we celebrate in worship on the closest Sunday. So with much importance ascribed to it by so many denominations, why does it garner so little attention? If I had to guess, I'd say it's because the Ascension is one of those biblical texts that's a little bit hard to explain. To an early Christian listener of this story, Jesus rising into the clouds in order to get to heaven would have made perfect sense. Before we knew things through science, people believed in a three-tiered existence with earth in the middle, heaven above, and hell below. And we still often speak of the universe in this manner, although we have long since learned that the earth is round and the sky above is filled with vast, dark, dangerous space, bigger than we can comprehend and filled with things that we can't even imagine yet. So when we think of the ascension today, it becomes harder for us to imagine. And we tend to sometimes approach things rather analytically. Where exactly did Jesus go? What were the logistics of this ascent? Did he float up past the moon, past Mars? How exactly did he get to heaven? And oh, by the way, where is heaven? And it's easy to let ourselves get bogged down in these kinds of technical questions. But might I suggest that we shouldn't? Because the important question of the ascension is not the where, the what, or the how. The important question of the ascension is the why. Why did Jesus go away at all? Jesus died. Jesus was resurrected. Jesus spent 40 days appearing to his disciples in locked rooms, on lake shores, and on the road to Emmaus proving that he had risen, that he was not a ghost, that his body was still marked with the scars of crucifixion, and that his body still needed to eat real food. So why couldn't Jesus just spend the rest of eternity appearing in this way to his followers? Now, the easiest answer to that is that Jesus had to ascend into heaven to complete the fulfillment of scripture. In the scriptures, the prophets foretold that Jesus would die, be resurrected, and ascend into heaven. And so he did. But there is another, deeper answer to the why of the ascension as well. When Jesus was here, when he was incarnated, when he took on human flesh and lived as one of us, he came to be our teacher. Jesus came to show us the way, the truth, and the life. He came to fulfill the law with love and to show us how to do the same. It could be argued that Jesus is the greatest teacher that ever lived. And good teachers know that eventually they have to leave their students. If the teacher is always hovering around, always available at any second to help out or to step in, the student will never truly learn what they need to learn. If they know they can always rely on the teacher to be there, they won't learn how to succeed on their own. And it is only when the teacher leaves that the students realize they did learn something, they do know how to do this, and they can do what their teacher taught them even without that teacher physically present right by their side. So Christ ascended into heaven, not only to fulfill the scriptures, but so we, his followers, could begin to fulfill his commandments. We no longer follow the embodied Christ. We now have to embody the living Christ. So Ascension Sunday commemorates the day the teacher left the classroom. Christ left us with work to do, and with the power to do it through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Next Sunday on Pentecost, we will celebrate the day that the Holy Spirit 
descended to be with us. But today, Ascension Sunday, we celebrate the day that Christ ascended to be with the Father. And like I said to the children when they were in front, that doesn't mean that he is no longer with us at all, but that he is with us in a different way. In my home denomination, the United Methodist Church, which is the descendant of that American Methodist Church that Wesley began so many years ago, there is a line in our communion liturgy that I think really illustrates this point. So every time we gather to take communion, whoever is presiding over the element says this, may this bread and wine be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood at work in this world. That we may be the body of Christ. Jesus is no longer present in his physical body. He is now present in our physical bodies. This is what the ascension teaches us. We are entering a new phase. It is time to leave the classroom. It is time to do what Christ taught us and to take that step into the world. And there's one more important lesson that we can learn for the, from the Ascension. And this one was pointed out to me by the Reverend David Lowes, who is one of my favorite Christian authors. Lowes points out that the Ascension is worth remembering and worth celebrating because it reminds us that we cannot limit God. For while God came to us in the flesh and in the person of Jesus, Jesus' ascension reminds us that we can't restrict God to any one place. Jesus' ascension, then, isn't solely about his leaving, his disciples, us, the world. But rather, it is about the simultaneous confession that, one, God has chosen at times to be located in our physical world so that God may be accessible to us. And two... God refuses to be limited to even those important places. When I first came across this quote years ago, I shared it with my congregation at the time. And I expanded on the idea that we cannot limit God to a particular building or people or style of worship or denomination. Nothing can limit God's ability to be present for others. Back then I said that sometimes we like to put God in a box, don't we? We like to make God seem safe, easy to follow, with clearly defined rules and regulations, easy to control. But God is so much bigger than any box we could imagine or create to keep God in. God will always be breaking the boundaries of what we think is possible or even what we think is appropriate or acceptable. And if the past two years of COVID and lockdowns and online worship have taught us anything, it is the truth that God will always be breaking our boundaries of what we think is possible. Look at all the new ways that we figured out how to worship in the past two years online with Facebook and Zoom, which both of which we're still doing, putting worship services on YouTube. We had worship that was printed and sent out in the mail or delivered by hand to people's front doors. And even several times, all of the churches here in Monmouth gathered outdoors on farmland that usually belongs to the sheep. I hope that as we are coming out of this time and have returned mostly to normal worship, we remember the boundaries that God broke down during that time, and that we will always continue to seek creative ways to worship and serve God beyond business as usual. Now, last year, when I preached the Ascension, I was on Zoom, and I was preaching just to my little congregation of Trellick. And I shared a quote with them that I've used a couple times in sermons in the United States. And after worship, they very kindly let me know that it needed a little translation from American English into British English. 
So the quote I shared is from a church advertising campaign that was put out by the United Church of Christ, which is a US-based denomination. And the UCC launched the campaign in 2004 as a way to try and revitalize and grow their churches. And the slogan is this, never place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. Or to put it in British English, as I learned, never place a full stop where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. And I think this is a humble and powerful reminder that we cannot limit God because we worship a living, loving, and active God. We don't worship the pages of a book We worship the God we believe and trust to be behind those words. And that God is not done speaking to us. It's why his son Jesus lives in our hearts now instead of physically in the world. And it's why we were given the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we will celebrate on Pentecost. In so many places in scripture, Jesus has promised us that we are not done learning. That as good of a teacher as he was, he has not taught us everything yet. The Holy Spirit is coming, he promises, even with these last words as he prepares to ascend. We must be willing to listen, to learn, to change, to grow. The author and poet Maya Angelou once wrote this, do the best you can until you know better then when you know better, do better. As followers of Christ, I think we always seek to do the best we can in following his teachings. But we must always be willing to keep our hearts and our minds open to the prompting and the movement of the Holy Spirit. And when we know better, we can do better. God is still speaking, and God cannot be limited. So today we celebrate the day the teacher left the building, leaving us to show him what we have learned. Today we celebrate that God will not be contained or limited by our minds or imaginations. Today we celebrate a God that calls us to keep learning, to keep trying, and to not limit him or ourselves. Because with God and with Christ, And with the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. Amen. Our next hymn is number 350. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship.
love that hymn. The music, first of all, is amazing. And then just the way the words sort of compare and contrast the things that we know and the things that we don't know. Because so much of faith is still a mystery. So let us lean into that mystery and be together in a spirit of prayer as we pray for ourselves and for our world. And as we pray, when you hear me say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving and gracious God, we come to you this morning with so much on our hearts and minds. From perhaps the busyness of this week, or maybe the quietness of this week. We've all chosen to be together here this morning and to turn our focus to you. So God, we give thanks for you and your love, for your son, Jesus Christ, who lives in us, and for your Holy Spirit that continues to guide and teach us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up prayers this day for those in our midst, and for those whom we haven't yet met, for any who are sick and in need of your healing, for any who are grieving and in need of your comfort. We give thanks for those who dedicate their lives to care for those who are in need. And we just pray, God, that you will be with all those who need you this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our community, for anywhere that there is unrest or disquiet. We pray for the places on Mono Street that have been affected by the fire this week. We give thanks for those who came and put out that fire, who give their lives to protect others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up prayers for anywhere in this world where there is violence and oppression and war. We lift up particularly the people in Ukraine. And we pray for those who have fled seeking safety. And we pray that they may find it. And we pray for those who have stayed to try and defend their homeland and those who cannot. But most of all, God, we pray for peace, for that day that you have promised us in scripture, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. So God, we pray for that day to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, we pray for all the places in this world that are affected by natural disasters, by hurricanes and wildfires and tornadoes. We pray for this world that you have given us to be stewards of, that we might find the courage to treat it better, to care for it as the gift that it is. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we pray that we will have the courage to follow Jesus' greatest commandment. That we are to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind. And that we are to love others as we love ourselves. So may your Holy Spirit show us the best way for us to live out that love and to follow Jesus' call on our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us take a few moments together in relative silence to lift up our own personal prayers to God.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we know that even the cries of children are seen as prayer to you. So we give thanks for having children in our midst this morning. And we lift all of our prayers to you, whether spoken or left unspoken. For we know that you hear all that is on our hearts and minds. So we lift these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray together as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Due to... Uh, sort of safety protocols. We still aren't passing and offering plates, but there is one at the door if you choose to give uh, either as you arrive or as you leave. So let us pray together over any gifts that have been or will be given this day. Loving and gracious God, we know that all that we have comes from you. So we give back to you just a small portion of what you have given to us. We pray that these gifts will be used to share your love with this community and to shine the light of Christ in this world. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Now let us rise as we are able to sing our final hymn, O Four, A Thousand Tongues to Sing, at number 364.
Christ lives in all of you. And let us say the words of the grace to each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. And again, you're invited to come in for coffee and tea, and then I'd say in about 15 minutes, we'll start.